Factors Affecting Solution Formation. Okay, so as we get started talking about solutions, let's remind ourselves of a few things regarding what they are and how we describe them. So the first is when a solution is formed, it's a physical process, not a chemical reaction. And solutions form based on this tendency toward mixing or increasing entropy, and also the degree to which the intermolecular forces for the solute and the solvent match. So those are the important aspects of solution formation. Now, we're also going to talk about enthalpy of solution. And so basically this is heat of solution. The energetics of solution formation can basically be divided into three processes. And so that's what we're going to talk about one at a time. And the first one is that it requires energy to push apart those solvent molecules. And so we have to overcome the intermolecular attractions in that solvent, and we need to push apart those solvent molecules. We need to do the same thing with the solute molecules or particles. So we need to push apart the solute particles, and this also requires energy. We have to overcome these inner particle attractions. And then finally, if it's energetically possible, a solution will form. So if the solute-solute interactions are at least as favorable as the solute-solute or solvent-solvent interactions, so in other words, the pure solute and the pure solvent, the interactions between themselves, if they're at least as favorable, then energy will be released upon solution formation. So we'll have an exothermic reaction, a negative delta H solution. So heat will be released. The flask will heat up upon this solution forming. Now, if the solute-solvent interactions are less favorable than the solute-solute or solvent-solvent interactions, then energy is going to have to be absorbed from the surroundings. And so we have an endothermic process or a positive delta H of solution. Now, we can also express this in a mathematical way. And so here we have our delta H of solution. Here's the enthalpy required to push apart, or the energy required to push apart the solvent molecules. Here's the energy required to push apart the solute particles. And finally, here's the enthalpy associated with formation of a solution. And if we add all those together, then we're going to get delta H solution. OK, so here's a graphical view of the same thing. So let's look at this exothermic solution first. All right, so here's the solvent at some enthalpy and the solute at some enthalpy. And notice we're going from the particles enjoying those intermolecular attractions, okay, in the pure substance to pushing them apart. And you can see that delta H is positive for both of these two steps. And so that's that requires energy. We have to put energy in in order to push apart those solute particles from each other and the solvent particles from each other. And at the highest energy in the process, we have these separated par particles, but we haven't allowed them to mix yet, okay? So separated particles at high energy, and upon solution formation, if we have an exothermic solution, then heat will be released as we allow them to mix, okay? So this is a negative delta H solution. Okay, so this is this difference. This is delta H solution. So step one added to step two. Now we're at a large positive number. An even larger negative number is added to get an overall negative delta H of solution. Okay, so now let's look at an endothermic solution formation. Okay, so same thing. We have the first two steps where we have to push apart solvent mo molecules from each other. We have to push apart solute particles from each other. We end up at this high energy, unstable place where we have just separated particles. When we allow them to mix, we have a solution forming. And this delta H for the third step is negative. So energy is released upon solution formation, but it's not enough to be lower than the solute and the solvent separately, OK? And so this is the situation where when we add these three steps, we still have a positive delta H of solution. 
Okay, so you might be asking yourself at this point, why would a solution form if the overall process is endothermic? If we have to put energy into it, why would it even happen? And the reason is entropy. And we're going to talk about entropy a lot more in chapter 19, but entropy basically is a tendency toward disorder or possibility states or mixing. And so basically, it's the fact that the solute and solvent particles are all mixed together and there's much more disorder. And so that is the driving force for an endothermic solution formation process. Okay, so when we take the solute and we dissolve it in a solvent and distribute it throughout the whole volume. So, all right, so let's think about this. So entropy is increased when we dissolve a solute in a solvent. We just talked about that, okay? So we have mixing. Now, if we have a positive delta H solution, then entropy is gonna be the actual driving force for solution formation, okay? Now, entropy increases during an exothermic reaction also. If delta H is negative and entropy is increased, then they agree and the solution will form. So let's think about this in terms of sodium chloride dissolved in water, okay? So remember, we're gonna take a solid sodium chloride, we're gonna dissolve it into solution. So we have aqueous sodium ions and aqueous chloride anions. So we're gonna push apart water molecules. So that is increasing enthalpy, delta H1. We have to overcome the lattice energy of sodium chloride, that's delta H2. And so energy will be released upon solution formation because the ion dipole attractions are favorable and we have increased the entropy. Okay, so let's summarize these energetics of solution formation. There are a couple of easy ways to remember it. And one is that substances with similar intermolecular forces tend to be soluble in one another. And so we like to say like dissolves like. So in other words, nonpolar solvents dissolve nonpolar solutes. Polar solvents are more likely to, to dissolve ionic and polar solutes. So like dissolves like. If the intermolecular forces are similar, then we would predict that a solution would form. Okay, so what about gases dissolved in liquids? And when we think about that, we have to use Henry's Law. And so this is, these are gases dissolved in a solvent. Now, here we have gas dissolved. Let's say this is oxygen dissolved in water, okay? And we have some partial pressure of oxygen above the solution. So basically, the higher this partial pressure is of the gas molecules above the solution, the more gas will be dissolved in the solvent, okay? So the solubility of a gas in any solvent increases when we increase the pressure of that gas above the solvent. Now we can express it mathematically too. So S sub G, that's the solubility of the gas, and that's in molar, that's molarity. Here's the partial pressure of that gas. And K is the Henry's Law constant and it is specific for each solvent gas pair at a given temperature. So it's a very specific constant for each system, and so you would look this up. You would look up the Henry Law's constant for the system you were working with. Okay, what about temperature effects? And the general trend is that solubility of most solids in water increases with increasing temperature. So let's think about this from the perspective of dissolving sugar in water. Cold water will dissolve less sugar than hot water. And the solubility of gases goes in exactly the opposite direction. The solubility of gases decreases with increasing temperature. So here are a whole bunch of substances, okay? So we can see that generally the solubility increases with increasing temperature, okay? So here's our solubility, which is grams per 100 grams of water. And here's our temperature. And so generally all of these substances increase in solubility 
with increasing temperature. All right, so next we will talk about colligative properties.